Okay, so <clears throat> so last time um, yeah, uh, so we are currently studying about the eigenvector and eigenvalue. So basically uh, the role of eigenvector is as you know, we change this matrix vector multiplication with just a simpler version of this uh, scalar and vector mul vector multiplication. So this is an X. So in this case of a recursive uh, description of a sequence of an AX. So, so given X0 vector, which is an initial vector, you just keep multiplying A over and over. And then the resulting vector was converging to uh, an eigenvector to the lar uh, with the largest singular uh, sorry uh, largest uh, eigenvalue. So that's what we saw last time from some uh, some MATLAB example last time. And in this case, in this case, it considers a, a simpler case where uh, your mate. Uh, initial vector x0 is set as one of your eigen vector. So in this particular case, you just set x0 so that uh, it yeah it satisfies this uh, uh, original eigen vector value equation. Okay. So in this case. If you keep multiplying a, and then uh, it will be changed to lambda, and then if you multiply it with the k times, and then it's like a to the power of k, x0 becomes lambda k, and x0. Okay? So uh, this is the uh, contents of the last slide in this chapter. So that is it for. Uh, chapter 5.1 then we will move on to chapter 5.2 which is about the characteristic equation so again the um, overall uh, big picture uh, was uh, already explained like two lectures ago so we mainly deal with the uh, determinant in this case uh, in this lecture <coughs> okay so <coughs> So uh, as you studied the, about the determinant last time, I mean the, uh, when preparing for the, la uh, the, the second midterm exam, so we can consider the uh, determinant for each of the uh, row operation. So we consider three different row operation. So the first one is, yeah, so let's just uh, consider the simpler one, row exchange. Okay, in this case, yeah, I'm gonna just. Yeah, yeah so row exchange that is changing A, B, C, D, E, F, G, uh, H, I as. Yeah, you know what the row exchange means. So yeah, let me just uh, use a simpler, uh, yeah, simple example A B C D, and then we change it to C D A B. So in this case, what's the relationship between the determinant between these two? So it changes the sign, right? So each row interchanges will put your minus one. So if you uh, do the row exchanges like four times you will just multiply uh, minus one to the power of four which is just a one right so uh, so yeah that's the effect of determinant when doing this uh, row exchange and then uh, what about the row replacement in that case um, a b c d and then <coughs> we multiply some row or the second row for example or we multiply the second row k times and then add them up to the first row and in that case 
it will become kc b plus kd and uh, the second row remains the same so that's the row exchange uh, sorry uh, row replacement so in this case determinant of a b c d yeah so uh, determinant of it is how can we change that so in this case so we look at the particular row and then uh, if that particular row is the summation of the two rows a comma b plus kc kd so in this case uh, it will become determinant of a b c d which uses the first first thing first row and then the second part will be kc kd and cd right so that was the first three <coughs> conditions that we start with when uh, studying this uh, determinant okay so from here this is the same as this original determinant but what about this and in this case uh, we change it to this way so we can factor k out in this case and then cd cd right so just like uh, we uh, decomposed this particular row into the summation of the two rows uh, when uh, a certain row is uh, uh, scaled by the factor of k and then we can factor it out in this form and then from here we learn that yes yeah, so the initial uh, condition or uh, requirement for the determinant to satisfy is that in case we have this identical rows and then uh, we always have the determinant of uh, zero so this part the determinant becomes zero and then this will be the same as the determinant of the original uh, matrix okay <clears throat> okay and then lastly we have a row scaling okay but uh, just yeah if you remember how we performed the LU decomposition uh, we completely ignored or excluded this row scaling so we didn't do any row scaling and uh, we only performed row exchange and row replacement to obtain just a uh, echelon form not the reduced echelon form because the reduced echelon form requires this uh, scaling of a particular row so <clears throat> Okay, so by using these two, we can change any matrix A into its upper triangular matrix U or echelon form of a matrix A, which is U. Okay, so in this case, row replacement doesn't change anything on the uh, determinant of the original matrix, but uh, what about this? So uh, in that case, so if you also remember the row operation, and then uh, each of the row operation can be represented as a uh, elementary matrix. So this is the first row operation, and then it's the second row operation, and so on. So suppose we perform the p number of p different row operation, and then that's how we can obtain this matrix U, and then uh, uh, this part was becoming your L part or L inverse part in this case, yeah, for LU decomposition, right? So in this case, the uh, okay, okay, so yeah, and then in this case we know the determinant. So you know that this guy, determinant of A times B equals the determinant of A, determinant of B, right? So in this product of all these matrices, uh, we can decompose the determinant value into this guy. Determinant of P, EP, determinant EP minus 1, and then determinant of E1, determinant of A, will become the same as determinant of U. Okay, so <clears throat> this is the original determinant, and then 
from this part some will be row exchange and some will be row replacement and then some uh, row replacement the determinant value will be one and then deter uh, row exchanges that will change the, de the sign of the determinant so depending on the number of row exchanges we can represent yeah so this whole part will become either one or minus one right so basically yeah essentially the determinant of an a and is uh, the determinant of its echelon form, they will become just the same, uh, except for their sign. Okay, so that way we can represent it in this way. So the determinant of an A um, is the this part with determinant of U times uh, either one or minus one, and here R is the number of row exchanges. So if it's an odd number like a one, three, five, and so on. And then uh, it will become minus one, right? But uh, yeah, if it's an even number, and then it will be just a one. And then, <clears throat> what is the determinant of u? So u, uh, which is our uh, astral form, that will have this upper triangular shape. So in this upper triangular shape, we know uh, how we can compute the determinant. So the determinant is uh, just the same as the product of all the uh, diagonal entries so we just multiply all of them okay so that will become the determinant of u okay <clears throat> and then let's consider these two situations where uh, the uh, matrix a is invertible or not invertible so in the case of an invertible matrix so again we are considering only the square matrix like a four by four matrix yeah so four by four so if we consider its echelon form, and then uh, if it is invertible matrix, and then every column should have a pivot, right? Which means all the columns that A has should be linearly independent, right? So in this case, we have four columns, and then uh, each of the four columns should have a pivot in this echelon form. And the only possible way will be to have all those diagonal entries as non-zero values. So all these X marks should be non-zero values. So that's when we have a pivot in every row. Okay, so that's when our matrix is invertible. But in other case where the matrix A is not invertible, and then the pivot will be shifted to the right okay so pivot cannot be go below cannot go below because um, as a particular column we only yeah we can only have just one pivot okay so in this case suppose this guy had this guy has a pivot here and then this guy did not have a pivot but the, in uh, in this case uh, this one uh, yeah suppose this one was not linearly independent column so this one didn't have a pivot okay so in this case it could be something like this okay so in this case we have a pivot here and here and here so that's when the columns of a is linearly in, uh, linearly dependent and thus a is not invertible okay so <clears throat> if we compare these two the shapes of the pivots or the patterns about where the pivots are appearing can be compared between these two so the patterns of these pivots can be either shifted to the right or is uh, is placed exactly along the M diagonal okay so in this case if we compare the determin uh, if we consider the determinant value and then this guy will have non zero determinant and the uh, non-zero determinant will have this uh, the product of all these values so if it is like a, a 3 1 minus 2 and 4 and then the determinant value will be just all the uh, product of these two uh, product of these four numbers so that will become the determinant and thus that's why the determinant of a is non-zero means uh, a is invertible 
And uh, uh, in this particular case, where uh, some columns are linearly, uh, linearly dependent, which does not have a pivot, in this case, if we, uh, if we consider the determ yeah, the, the, uh, this diagonal entries, since at some point, since some pivots are shifted to the right, shifted to the right, and thus uh, along the M diagonal, there should be some uh, zero entries. So once we see one shift, at least one shift in here, and that means along the M diagonal, we see all zeros. Okay, after that. So after then, we see all zeros along the M diagonal. And in this case, the determinant value, which is the product of all these diagonal value, will become zero. And that's when A is not invertible. Right? <clears throat> okay, so that's the relationship of the determinant and this invertible versus not invertible matrix. Okay, so let's see. What's that? <clears throat> and then it's time for uh, thinking about eigenvalue and also the determinant of the matrix A. Okay, so back to this eigenvalue thing. In case AX equals lambda x and then we can derive that into this form and then yeah it's uh, uh, the uh, basic thing that we learned in this particular homogeneous linear system uh, should have a non-trivial solution and then that means a minus lambda a minus lambda i should be the determinant should be zero okay so <clears throat> A is invertible. What was the meaning of invertible matrix? And the, uh, its equivalent condition, again, was this guy. So the determinant of an A should be non-zero. So in this case, we can consider this guy as this form. So A minus lambda times identity matrix is not zero, right? So determinant of an A a can be rewritten as A minus 0 times I. So in this case, this is when lambda is set as 0. And when lambda is set as 0, and then your determinant of this particular homogeneous linear system, the determinant will not be 0. And thus, it will only have trivial solutions. So there should be no trivial, no non-trivial solution, right? Because this part is completely in invertible because that is that has the determinant of non non-zero determinant. So that means when lambda is zero, that cannot be I eigen eigenvalue. So that cannot be eigenvalue. So the number zero is not eigenvalue of an A. Okay. Eh? Eh, ja. <coughs> 이거 되게 간단한 건데, 자, 램다가 3이, 3이 이게 아이겐밸류다라고 얘기를 하면, 이건 어떻게 이해를 해야 되겠어요? 아이겐벡터는 일단 모르긴 몰라도, 최소한 a-3i는 디터미넌트가 0이 돼야 돼요. 맞죠? 그러면, 내가 람다가 0이, 0이라고 했어요. 그리고 이게 아이겐밸류라고 했다면, 똑같은 얘기로, 이거는 무슨 뭐랑 똑같냐? a-0i가 디터미넌트를 0으로 가져야 된다는 뜻이에요. 그죠? 근데 이 말은 그 뭐냐? 결국 디터미넌트의 a가 0이어야 된다는 뜻이고요. 이 말은 뭐냐? 그냥 eigenvalue, eigenvector 이런 거다 띄워버리고 앞에서 배웠던 것처럼 a의 디터미넌트가 0이다라는 건 뭐야? a가 인버터블 하지 않다는 거잖아요. 그죠? 그러니까, 그러니까, 거꾸로 A가 인버터블 하다면, 디터미넌트 오브 A는 난 0일 거고요. 0이 될수 없어요. 이 말은, 거꾸로, 람다가 0일 때에는, 아이겐 밸류 이 식에서 바라볼 때에는, 이 식에서 바라볼 때에는, 네, 아, 람다가 아이겐 밸류가 될 수가 없다는 뜻이죠. 오케이, okay, so, 
I think this is a uh, quite simple, although it's just a uh, uh, tricky to just uh, uh, verbally state these relationships. <clears throat> okay, so yeah, the this guy is the determinant of a is not zero. Yeah, that's what we know, and that was also shown from this kind of. The, uh, this kind of uh, uh, determinant from this echelon form, okay? So in case echelon form has non-zero values along the diagonal, which means every column has a pivot, and then, yeah, the uh, A is invariable, and in that case, the determinant of an A is just a non-zero value. But in this case, yeah, the pivots are shifted to the right and then if we look at the um, uh, diagonal uh, diagonal entries and then at some point uh, the diagonal values will all be zero because those the bil uh, the uh, values below these pivots like uh, below these pivots will all be zero okay so <clears throat> so that is about this determinant and then yeah, so it's all, again the deter yeah the properties of determinant that we already know. So a is invariable. That is the that is equivalent. It's this guy, and then the product of these two, these two matrices of the determinant value can be represented as the product of the determinant of each value each matrices, and then this is also another properties that we also learned. Yeah, so. Uh, in order to prove this guy, we utilized the LU thing, right? Okay, and then there are two more the properties of the determinant that we already know. If A is triangular matrix, and then the determinant of it is the product of the diagonal entries. And then, yeah, also another one that we already know, a uh, row replacement doesn't change the determinant row exchange will change the sign of the determinant and then this uh, scaling row scale yeah row scaling will change the determinant so what was the row scaling so yeah let me just briefly mention that so a b c d and then yeah let's just use a simple number so it's like uh, uh, 3a 3b c and d and then uh, what about the determinant of it? Starting, yeah, based on the three uh, starting uh, conditions that satisfies that the determinant uh, will satisfy, um, our assumption or starting point was that in this case we can factor these uh, scalar out. So it's really simple, becoming this form, right? Three times the original determinant. Okay. But as you saw, uh, yeah. So as you saw from the last last exam, what about this? Three times A B C D, which is three times matrix A, and that will be three A three B three C three D. So in this case, so we can do this. Uh, we can uh, convert this guy row by row. So we only consider uh, one single row at a time when. Uh, uh, when considering the, de the determinant, so in this case, the determinant of this guy will be um, three times the determinant. <coughs> of, yeah, so we focus first on the first row, and then it will be it will be something like this: three C, three D, and then uh, it will. Uh, let's move on to the second row, and then uh, it will be. Uh, Three again, and then determinant of an A, B, C, D. Okay, so in that case, it's actually three times three to the power, of, yeah, three squared times the determinant of the original matrix. Okay, and in this case, as you imagine, uh, three times A, and then the determinant of this guy, and then suppose A was like, yeah, twelve by twelve matrix. Uh, so the matrix size is a 12 by 12, and then uh, uh, this guy will be 3 to the power of 12 times the determinant of A, because we are handling each row one by one, right? Okay. <clears throat> okay.
Okay, and then now it's uh, yeah we yeah we mainly uh, recalled what we learned about the determinant, but this time we go yeah we come back to the main uh, issue of this ax equals lambda x, and then in terms of the determinant, we know this guy should be zero when lambda is your uh, determin uh, lambda is your eigenvalue, and then this equation is called this characteristic equation and now uh, uh, yeah uh, and then yeah so it's uh, basically an equation and then uh, as we uh, saw uh, in the last time if it was four by four matrix yeah so let's use just a three by three so one two three four five six seven eight nine and then minus lambda i will become one minus lambda five minus lambda nine minus lambda and then if we consider that, yeah, if we uh, evaluate the determinant of this guy, and then it's, uh, it's basically third order polynomial, right? So it's basically, yeah, the third order uh, equation, which has maximum, yeah, which has uh, uh, possibly three different solutions. Okay, so characteristic has the degree of n when the matrix A is n by n okay so yeah in Korean simply n by n matrix is on characteristic equation n cha bangjong shi n cha bangjong shi okay so in this case characteristic equation so it's a very simple uh, upper triangular matrix form <coughs> and then this is an a minus lambda i and then the determinant is just the product of the diagonal entries and so it's represented in this form and so it should be zero and then uh, that's what, uh, how we obtain the, uh, the, the eigenvalues in this case <clears throat> okay now it's time for learning about this new term about this multiplicity and also it's called this algebraic multiplicity so multiplicity uh, is yeah uh, just uh, how many times the same root is repeated or what is in Korean for this multiplicity multiple roots it's called yeah, 중군이요, 중군. 중군. 중이 뭐, 무슨 중이죠, 이게? 한자로? 뭐, 무거울 중으로 아마 한자로는 쓸 텐데, 이게 아마 반복된다라는 의미에서, repeated, repeated root is called 중군이죠. Yeah, repeated root. So, yeah, let's look at this equation. So, once we have this kind of form, we know lambda is repeated, uh, uh, 5 is repeated by 2 times, right? But uh, lambda equals 3 and 1, they are only repeated once, so, so they are not a multiple root. So in that case, we can, yeah, in terms of the multiplic multiplicity, it has the uh, two uh, multiplicity, two times of a multiplicity. So this one, it has a single, and this one has a single multiplicity, okay? So that's the meaning of this uh, multiplicity. And then this algebraic thing. <coughs> so, <coughs> yeah, there are two kinds of a multiplicity. So one is algebraic multiplicity, and then the other is geometric multiplicity. So geometric multiplicity is uh, coming from, yeah, coming from some kind of basis and the number of bases uh, from your spaces. So uh, geometric multiplicity uh, can be understood from uh, your space, geometric in a geometric sense but uh, when purely looking at this when we purely looking look at this uh, uh, equation and then it's just an equation and uh, that's why we call the multiplicity coming from this equation as algebraic multiplicity so algebra means so we are learning about the linear algebra but algebra or algebraic operation is something like uh, 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 adding subtracting and uh, uh, multiplying and uh, dividing and, and something like that so it's a, a purely based on this just kind of equation of the numbers and so on. So uh, algebraic multiplicity means the, L, uh, the multiplicity 
coming from purely from this uh, equation. And now uh, we will see the uh, geometric multiplicity. So it's uh, kind of a, uh, is shown at the end of the last uh, in the next lecture. But uh, let's see. Yeah. <clears throat> So if we yeah if we remember how we obtain the eigenvalue and eigenvector, so they are paired, right? So uh, we can consider different pairs of an eigenvalue and eigenvector that satisfies this guy. So if we have one pair of lambda one and x one, so that is one pair of eigenvalue and vector. And in that case, we know this guy. So it satisfies this equation, right? Okay, so in this case, let's see. <clears throat> so how we obtain these pairs of eigenvalue and eigenvector? So we basically compute or solve for this characteristic equation. And then A, suppose A was, yeah, so A was like 4 by 4. And then we know this guy is fourth order uh, polynomial equation. And that means lambda has four different value and then <clears throat> suppose that lambda has this guy so uh, um, 3 minus 2 and 5 so it had a four root but here uh, 3 had a two algebraic multiplicity okay so it was something like 3 minus lambda squared minus 2 minus lambda and 5 minus lambda equals 0. So that was your characteristic polynomial. Okay? So in this case, what was the next step? For each of these eigenvalue, we compute their uh, corresponding eigenvector by setting this guy, a minus lambda i times x equals 0. So we basically solve for uh, this homogeneous linear system, right? And then, <clears throat> in this case, so let's consider now the, the basis or the dimension. So what was the meaning of the dimension or the definition of the dimension? So you first obtain the basis vectors for your subspace, and then the number of basis vectors were called dimension of that subspace, right? So that was the meaning of the dimension. So in this case, <clears throat> So which did yeah which one yeah which determines yeah so what determines the dimension of the null space of this guy? So what was the dimension or what determines the dimension of this homogeneous linear system? And uh, yeah, eh? for sure. So the number of free variable will give you the dimension, right? So if you have like a three a free variable. And then each of these three free variables will form one vector from your parametric vector form. Right? So each of these uh, 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 vectors from your parametric vector form, the number of those vectors will uh, will have yeah will yeah will form the dimension, right? And in terms of the number of free variables or uh, yeah, yeah. So basically, the number of free variables or the dimension of the null space, that null, yeah, that dimension is called geometric multiplicity. Geometric multiplicity, because we are considering the basis of that uh, uh, subspace or the null space. Okay. So the number of bases for uh, the null space of this guy is called geometric multiplicity. So geometric multiplicity is again nothing but just the dimension of your null space when setting this uh, eigenvalue as three. And uh, uh, yeah, yeah, one interesting thing is that this geometric multiplicity or the number of basis vector in the null space is less than or equal to this algebraic multiplicity. Yeah. So in this case, and most I mean the maximum number of basis vector that you can have for this subspace or the null space is only the two. 
or it could be just one. Okay, it is pop. Is it possible to have zero dimension for this null space? Zero dimension means so. So the null space has a zero dimension, and that means the null space only contains zero, not like a line or the the plane or so on and so on, right? So the d dimension of the null space is zero, and then that, that means um, <clears throat> your null space will only contain zero, which means you only have trivial solution, but you don't have any non-trivial solution. So that's the meaning of uh, the dimension hat of zero for your null space, right? So, for each of these eigenvalues that we that you obtained, you will at least have one basis vector for your for your null space, right? So at least your null space will have the dimension of one, okay? But it also has the maximum value of yeah, the the maximum possible value, which is bounded by the number of or the the uh, algebraic multiplicity. So in this case, it will only have yeah, it will only have either one or two basis vectors for your null space. But what about this? So this one is to, uh, has just a one <coughs> uh, one algebraic multiplicity. So in this case, it has to have one uh, dimension at least, but at the same time, it's bounded by one because we only have one algebraic <coughs> multiplicity. Okay, so <clears throat> so let me bring this value as two one one, and then the geo yeah. So this is an algebraic multiplicity, and then this this is a geometric multiplicity, and that is either like all exactly the same as is algebraic multiplicity. So that's one case, and the second case could be having strictly less than the algebraic multiplicity in some in some entries or in some eigenvalue so in this case <clears throat> so here yeah one interesting kind of insight or understanding i mean one really important understanding about yeah yeah one really interesting characteristic about this is so usually the total sum of algebraic multiplicity it's the same as the uh, matrix dimension. So if A is 10 by 10, you will have 10th order polynomial equation for your characteristic equation. That will have um, <clears throat> total sum of 10 algebraic multiplicity, right? So simply we have 10 different, uh, not different, 10 roots, right? So 10 number of roots allowing the multiplicity. So so in this case, we have four roots, right? Allowing, uh, yeah, allowing to count three as two, two, three two times, right? So we count three as two times, and that's how we obtain the total number of roots as four, right? So in general, ten order polynomial will have ten dif uh, not different, ten uh, roots. So always, yeah, yeah, it's always true that. The total sum of algebraic multiplicity will be the same as the the, the matrix dimension. Okay, so in the case of ten and ten, suppose we have like a, yeah four different yeah four distinct eigenvalue or four distinct roots, but the, uh, considering their uh, algebraic multiplicity, it was something like this: three, 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 yeah, three, four. 2, 1. So in that case, does it sum up to 10, right? So we have, yeah, it can be, yeah, it is something like this. So, so, so minus, minus 5, minus lambda to the power of 3. So it's coming from here, okay? But anyways, so this is the uh, algebraic multiplicity. And then we can consider it's also uh, corresponding geometric multiplicity. And then uh, in that case, suppose we achieve the maximum possible number of geometric multiplicity. Or in this particular case, the dimension of the null space was 3 and 4, 2, 1. Okay? And in this case, yeah, it's time for applying the theorem that we learned last time. So, <clears throat> D 
the eigenvalues are different, and then the eigenvectors that was generated from each eigenvalues, those were, those sets of eigenvalues were completely in, linearly independent, right? So <clears throat> in this case, these uh, sets of yeah. So we have basically four different sets of vectors. So this is one basis vector, one set of basis vector, uh, forming or the spanning the subspace for this kind, this null space, and these are four, yeah, four different vec basis vectors that spans another uh, null space, right? And then all these vectors are living in the ten-dimensional vector space, and then in case we achieved the maximum possible geometric multiplicity. And then let's just collect all the eigenvectors together and then let's form just one single set of vectors. So it will give v1, v2, v3, and then this one, yeah, let's just enumerate, let's, or let's just call that as v4, v5, v6, v7, and so on. So let's just collect them into one single set of vectors. Okay, <clears throat> so in this case, we will have 10 different vectors, and then we can always say that these are linearly independent set. Why? Within each set, it has three, uh, <clears throat> three basis vector. So already, these three are linearly independent within that one single set, one single basis set. Okay, so that's, that was the definition of the, uh, this basis, right? So within each set, they are linearly independent. And then between, the, between, the between these two sets of bases, we know they are linearly independent as long as the eigenve uh, eigenvalues are different, right? So even after we collect all of them, we can still say that they are all linearly independent. Okay, <clears throat> so in case we achieve the maximum number of uh, geometric multiplicity, and then we know that maximum number of geometric multiplicity will sum up to ten, and then altogether ten different eigen vectors will be linearly independent, and thus we have a ten dimension and 10 linearly eigen 10 linearly independent vectors so some, something like this so 1 and 2 and 3 and they are linearly independent we keep adding one by one and they are all linearly independent and then uh, we have like yeah we are in three dimensional space and then we have we added three independent three linearly independent uh, vectors and then that means we have three three independent vectors and then it means we span the entire three dimensional space so that was that was the theorem called basis theorem or something like that, right? Basis theorem. So again, what was the condition? Two conditions of the basis. So basis should span your subspace, and then at the same time, the basis should be linearly independent, right? So there was two condition. But if we think about like, yeah, living in 10 dimensional space, if we consider 10 different vectors and they are linearly independent and then they are automatically spanning the entire, sub entire space of R10 or 10 vectors, we don't know they are linearly independent but we know 10 different vectors, 10 vectors are spanning the entire R10 space and then we can automatically say that they are linearly independent. Right? The spanning and then uh, linearly independent are kind of a uh, uh, interchange it. I mean switch, yeah, switch it between uh, back and uh, back and forth. In case we have the same number of dimensions, I mean the tor uh, this kind of the space dimension, and also the number of the same number of base, uh, the same number of basis vectors. Okay, so back to this. <clears throat> so here, yeah, the important, yeah, important meaning is that. Once you achieve this uh, uh, maximum possible geometric multiplicity, and then you're linearly, I mean, uh, you're, uh, uh, yeah, so 
total eigenvector set. So the set of all the eigenvectors will span your entire space of an uh, R10, for example, in this case. Okay, so that is really an important part. Okay, and then the next thing is about the similarity. So similarity is not just a generic term. It's a really a special term that has a particular definition. Okay, and then that definition is this guy. <clears throat> okay, so if we can write this equation. So, so the, here's the starting point. And uh, yeah, so we basically talk about the definition of this uh, similarity. And then similarity is considered between these two matrices, A and B, that has the same size of this square matrix, n by n matrix. So A and B has the same size of an m by n, I mean n by n. In that case, we call A is similar to B when this equation is satisfied for some p. Okay, so yeah, here's the kind of intuitive process. So we have a b, and then on the right we multiply. Uh, yeah, on the left we multiply p, and then on the right we multiply p inverse. And uh, if that re yeah that re the result from this operation is the same as a, and then a and b are similar. Okay. <clears throat> And this P can be any matrix, okay? So P can be any matrix. So you basically have a freedom. So, <clears throat> so suppose I give you uh, A as 1, 2, 3, 4, and then B is 4, 3, 2, 1. So this is just a hypothetical scenario. And then A yeah, so so you want to find uh, this relationship, but uh, this is not always true, I mean, for any arbitrary p. So suppose p was your, yeah, I'm, I'm going to set or I'm going to give you a predetermined p as 1, 0, 2, 0, for example. Okay, and then this one will not satisfy this equation. Okay, so if you if you just evaluate this expression, three two, uh, four two three two one and one two, uh, yeah, this is this is not invertible. So it cannot even be plugged into this equation, right? But what about this one two two one? In this case, you will uh, obtain its inverse p inverse, right? And then you just plug them in into this equation. So it will not be satisfied because I just chose p just randomly, okay? So <clears throat> in this case, yeah, what I'm trying to tell you is that p can be chosen in your favor or, yeah, not all the p Will not yeah, so all the p will not satisfy this of course, but if there is at least one p satisfying this equation, okay. So again, if you can if you can find at least one particular matrix p that is invertible of course because we have to plug uh, that matrix into this uh, p p inverse. Okay, in that situation, if where you can find uh, at least one p and then you call that A is simi yeah, similar to B. Okay. <clears throat> okay, so that is the definition of the similarity. And then, yeah, let me ask one really trivial question. If A is similar to B, then is it true? Is it true? <coughs> B is similar to A. So are they commutative? Right? This is the answer is yes. Okay. <coughs> so in this case, 
we have to find uh, P, yeah, so B is similar to A, and then we have to find, let's call that as Q, uh, QA, Q inverse, from the definition of the similar, okay? And then how can we find Q? So we know from here, so this is our initial assumption, and then we know uh, P exists, satisfying this guy, okay? And then let's set Q as P inverse, okay? <clears throat> and then from here, P, B, P inverse will become, yeah, so Q inverse will become P, and then Q inverse B, Q, okay? So that is A, so all, yeah, it's true all the way, so this is true. So in this case, we can uh, represent P, uh, B as Q, A, <laughs> Q inverse, okay? So we were able to find Q satisfying also this form, right? So <coughs> if A is similar to B, and then B is similar to A. So it's like just a playing with the, yeah, it may sound like a playing with the word, but uh, yeah, it's a, uh, yeah, it's kind of important. Okay, <clears throat> and then, yes. And then, <clears throat> let's slightly change our perspective. So, here initially we are given matrix A and B, but I will only give you the matrix A and P. Okay, and not B. So we don't, yeah, we don't care what the B, what the matrix B should should be. But I only give you A and P. And uh, here the assumption is that P is invertible, which means P inverse exists. So that is an in initial assumption. And then we can kind of consider the transformation using this P in the form of this guy, A, P, P inverse. So P, A, P inverse. So in this form, this will create some matrix. So let's call that matrix as, for example, C. Okay. So we didn't determine what the B or C was, but uh, we we started from A and P, and then we just uh, computed P A P inverse, and that made that will have some matrix that has the same size, and that is called. Yeah, so uh, transforming the matrix A using this P based on this equation and then obtaining the resulting matrix. So that is called similarity transformation. Okay? <clears throat> okay, and then... Okay, so... I cannot wait to tell you yeah, kind of in, yeah, interesting aspect about the similarity transformation. So from here, so given the matrix A, so why we are why are we learning this similarity thing in this chapter? So we are given an A, and then A will have its eigenvalues. Okay, and those eigenvalues will be obtained from characteristic equation. So you basically form this guy, determinant A minus lambda I coming zero right and then <clears throat> it will have yeah it will give you some uh, set of uh, eigenvalues by solving this equation okay so <clears throat> related to this uh, similarity transformation even if yeah so whatever p that you choose as long as that it, that is an invertible so you give me any p just like this so I set the p as this guy which is uh, invertible of course and then you just to perform this similarity transformation, multiplying P on the left and multiplying P inverse on the right. And that resulting matrix will have exactly the same eigenvalues. Okay, so that's why we learn about this similarity thing in this chapter. Okay, so again, similarity transformation will keep your eigenvalues to be the same. Okay, let's see why. <clears throat> so here's the theorem about this eigen, uh, the similarity. 
this really simple one, the similar uh, the theorem four is the determinant of p a p inverse is the same as determinant of a, and then if I ask you this as a kind of one of your final exam problem, and then you should be able to just to prove that. How? How you? How do you prove it? So it's the product of a three matrix. So determinant of p, determinant of a, determinant of p inverse, and then you know determinant of p inverse is one over determinant p. Okay. So this guy and this guy is cancelled out, and then the determinant of an a. Okay. But it's not the end. I mean, uh, it's not. Yeah, we are not done yet, because. <clears throat> so let's call this guy as B, okay? So B is, yeah. So yeah, it, yeah. So B is P, yeah. So yeah, let's follow this guy. So P inverse and P on the right. So in case B is obtained in this in this manner, then yeah, we prove that the determinant of B. It's the same as the determinant of an A, okay? But now, uh, when talking about the eigenvalue, we consider the determinant of this guy, A, B minus lambda I, and also B minus uh, determinant of A minus lambda I, right? Not just the determinant of the matrix itself, right? Okay, so in this case, yeah, so, yeah, the conclusion is this guy. So this will still be the same as this guy. Okay, so let's just to simply prove that. Okay, so b minus lambda i, and then b can be represented in this form, and lambda i, i can be represented in this form, p inverse p. Okay, and in this case, we can represent them as lambda times p inverse identity matrix and p, in this case, we can factor. Yeah, we can factor this two matrices out because they are multiplied on the left, and then the remaining part will be a p minus lambda p. And then we can further factor it out because it's uh, it has a p on the left uh, on the right. So p inverse and p, and then the middle part will be a minus lambda i. Okay. So, so starting from b minus lambda i, uh, we can represent that as this guy. So that means <clears throat> a is similar to b, which means this equation is satisfied. Okay, so that's the definition or the meaning of a being similar to b. Okay, but in that case, a minus lambda i is also similar to b minus lambda i. Why? This matrix times p inverse and p, and this will be the same as this guy. Okay. <clears throat> okay. And then, yeah, uh, considering the determinant of b minus lambda i, okay, so we put the determinant operator on here and here, and then the determinant of this guy will be decomposed into this form, and then this part and this part will be canceling, can, yeah, canceled out, and then the remaining part of determinant of b minus lambda i equals a determinant of an a minus lambda i, which <coughs> which shows uh, this thing that we have. Okay, and then. <coughs> So does it say, uh, so from there, does it give you, I mean, does it say, or yeah, let me ask in this way, does it make it true that uh, eigenvalues of A and B are the same? So, yeah, so if we consider this part, B minus lambda I and its determinant, its determinant is polynomial. Right, nth order polynomial of lambda, and this one is another polynomial, nth order polynomial, 
right? And these two polynomials are the same. And uh, we have two uh, possible, two different cases where, okay, so, <clears throat> so suppose the first polynomial was something like this, minus lambda squared, three lambda minus four. And then the second polynomial was minus lambda two minus two lambda plus five. So I'm gonna say, so I'm just saying these, yeah, let me just say these two are the same. Suppose they are the same. And then what will, what will we do? So we would naturally just, just try to solve a particular lambda, right? But in this case, it's just an equation, okay? It's only true for only a, part, uh, only a particular lambda value, only a particular value of lambda. So that's why we call that as an equation. So, so in other words, that is not always true. So that is not always true. It's only true when lambda is set as a particular value, right? But in this case, so in yeah, in Korean there are two different cases. What job? Equation means 방정식이죠. Equation. 방정식 말고 또 하나 뭐 있죠? 이게 대비되는 개념인지는 모르겠지만 또 하나 뭐 있죠? 방정식 말고 네? 항등식. 항등식이죠. 항등식. 방정식은 그러니까 어떤 특정 x에 대해서 만족하는 게 방정식이죠. 항등식은 모든 x에 대해서 다 만족하는 게 항등식이죠. 그렇죠? <clears throat> so, what I wanted to focus, yeah, what I wanted to emphasize in this part is that, is it Hangdengshik or Bangjongshik? What is It is Hangdengshik, Hangdengshik. Why is Hangdengshik? 이걸 우리가 증명할 때 어떤 특정 람다에 대해서만 만족한다라는 거를 사용한 적이 없어요. 이걸 증명할 때. 그죠? 그러니까 이식 혹은 이게 같다라고 하는 거, 이두 개의 디터미넌트가 똑같다라고 하는 거를 증명할 때 람다가 어떤 특정 밸류여야만 이게 증명이 된다 혹은 이게 참이 된다라는 거는 어디에서도 사용되지 않았어요. 그 말은 모든 람다에 대해서 조식이 항상 성립이 된다는 거고 그 말은 결국은 이 캐릭터리스틱 폴리노미얼 자체가 항등식이 뭐예요? 코이피션트까지 정확하게 똑같아야 그게 항등식인 거잖아요. 그래야 어떤 값을 집어넣어도 똑같아지는 거잖아요. 그렇기 때문에 캐릭터리스틱 폴리노미얼 자체가 똑같다는 게 바로 어, 이거의 의미가 돼요. Okay. So again, the meaning of this theorem is that the characteristic polynomial is completely the same or completely identical, including the degree or the coefficients of that uh, polynomial. Okay. So in that in that way, you will have the exact set of eigen uh, eigenvalues and also the corresponding multiplicity, algebraic multiplicity, because they will be just the exact same polynomial. Okay. <clears throat> but uh, what about the eigenvector? Will eigenvector change from this similarity transformation? Eigenvector will change. Okay. Yeah, it will definitely change. Yeah. So Okay, so we will see the example. Okay. <clears throat> so here in this case, yeah. So this these two matrices are not similar even though they have the same eigenvalues. So in this case the characteristic polynomial is not exactly the same. So in this case, 2 minus lambda squared is your characteristic polynomial. And in this case, 1 minus lambda and 2 minus lambda is your characteristic polynomial. So they are not Hangdengshi. Okay, and then this row operation, like a row scaling interchange and a row replacement, so that kind of transformation is not similar transformation. Okay, so in this case, 
suppose you performed some row operation on the matrix A and then it is not following the form as like this so if it was something like this uh, in that case uh, we can call that as a uh, similarity transformation but we are missing this part so row operation is not a uh, similarity transformation okay that's it for uh, chapter 5.2 then probably this is the last chapter that we will learn in this semester although I wish I yeah I wish I could uh, go further but uh, yep yeah. so the last chapter that we will learn is called diagonalization diagonalization <clears throat> So the diagonalization means uh, you basically change your, uh, your matrix, your input matrix, into a simpler form of diagonal matrix. So you are given a matrix, and then you change it to a diagonal matrix. And then how we do it is by using the, trans uh, the similarity transformation. Yeah, so it's uh, just really, yeah, oh, yeah. Some nonsense example, but uh, one, two, three, four. There, there is one kind of di uh, one way of making that as a diagonal, diagonal matrix. How? We just simply subtract these values from your matrix, right? So that is the simplest way, but uh, that's not interesting. Okay. What we are doing here is that we uh, multiply some matrix. On the left and in uh, multiply the inverse of it on the right and that way we uh, we <coughs> yeah we use this kind of a uh, similarity transformation okay and that's how we obtain some diagonal matrix okay so here is one example so we are given a and uh, we are given P and then <coughs> um, D, oh, yeah, so this can be viewed as this guy. So we are given A, and then for here, uh, we can just multiply P inverse on the left, and then P inverse and P will become D. So we transformed the input matrix A by using this similarity transformation so that the resulting matrix D is diagonal matrix. Okay? So this is one example. So you can easily verify this is true by plugging A, P, and D into this equation. Okay. So here, the reason for using similarity transformation is because similarity transformation doesn't change your eigenvalue. So A and D will have exactly the same set of eigenvalues. Right? And then in here, in order to solve or in order to obtain the eigenvalue, so we have to do this kind of thing. A minus lambda i becomes zero. I mean the determinant of it is zero. But in this case, we can right away say the determinant of uh, sorry, the eigenvalue of it. What is the eigenvalue in this case? Five. Hmm? Yeah, five and three. So the diagonal entries themselves will be your eigenvalues, right? So it's, it's the same even when your matrix is really large, right? So 1, 3, one, three 4, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0. So in this case, um, yeah, we can say that the eigenvalue will be 1, 3, 4, right? So <clears throat> this kind of diagonalization this diagonalization actually a process of revealing revealing uh, eigenvalues of your matrix along the diagonal of the um, matrix. Okay. Okay. Then, <clears throat> yeah, this uh, similarity transformation has uh, this kind of interesting characteristic. So a squared 
um, yeah, if A is P D P inverse, and then yeah, we just multiply them together, and then in the middle, this part will cancel out each other, uh, becoming an identity matrix, and then P D D P inverse, and then D D. What is D D? D times D, where D is a diagonal matrix, so it's like. 5 and 3, 0, 0, 5 and 3, 0, 0. Yep. And so uh, the resulting matrix is 5 to the, yeah, 5 squared and 3 squared, 0, 0. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, so so if we imagine a to the power of, for example, like ten, and then you will still have a p and p inverse on the left and right, and then in the middle, d to the power of ten, and d to the power of ten will become simply the element-wise power of five to the power of ten. Yep. <clears throat> so in the middle part, just the powering or keep multiplying the same uh, diagonal matrix will be easily computed. Okay. So that is uh, one kind of a, uh, advantage of this diag uh, diagonalization or the similarity transformation. Okay. So time's up today. So so we will finish the rest of this chapter uh, next time. And the next, uh, the next class will be our uh, last class. Okay, and then also, yeah, for your information, the video lecture video has been, uh, yeah, uploaded again. So you should be able to find like uh, the last like four or five uh, lectures uh, in the website. Okay, thank you very much. Go. Uh, 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 row operation. But the determinant is row scale, row replacement is together. Row scaling is the same as scaling. Row exchange is the same as scaling. Yeah. 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 0.2만인 학생이 좀 있는데 그 학생들 빼고 나면 한 54점 정도 되는 것 같아요. 30%가 그때 내가 계산했을 때 그러니까 위에서부터 30%에 해당하는 점수가 중앙고사 추가 아마도 70점 정도 됐었어요. 뭐가 바뀐 아 그거 그게 어떤 2번에서 증명해서 증명 문제 한 하나 중에 네, 굉장히 좀 이제 마이너하지만 있어야만 됐던 가정이 없는 채로 증명 문제가 나왔고요. 그러니까 A 트랜스포트 A의 디터미넌트가 항상 이보다 크거나 같아야 된다라는 거를 A라는 매트릭스가 스퀘어 매트릭스여야 된다라는 가정이 없었어서 그걸 이렇게 두 개를 띌 수가 없었어요. 이게 다 합해서 열 개가 되잖아. 네. 근데 이게 작으니까. 네. 이게 막 2가 될 수도 있잖아요. 네, 3이나. 맞아요. 그러면 네. 그 전체를 포함 못 시키는 네. 그런 경우도 있고.